So it's now time for chapter 13. When yelling doesn't work. The dragon slept on as the council of war argued about what to do next. I'm going to write a strongly worded letter to Professor Rubbish, said Strike the Vast. This book needs a lot more words to tell you what to do if yelling doesn't work, which shows how cross Stoich was. He never wrote a letter if he could help it. Stoich, in fact, was really rattled for the first time in his life. This is what comes of not following the law, he thought to himself. If I would banished the boys last night, like I should have done, they would not be here to die with the rest of us. I should have put my trust in Thor. Mogadon, the meathead, had not yet realised the gravity of the situation. He thought it was a question of constructing some sort of megathorn machine to make the yell sound bigger. A gigantic dragon just needs a gigantic yell, he said. We already tried that, oh plankton brain, said Stoich. Who are you calling plankton brain? demanded Mogadon, and they went whisker to whisker like a couple of furious walruses. Hiccup sighed and walked out of the village. He had a feeling the grown-ups weren't going to come up with anything fiendishly clever. To Hiccup's surprise, he was followed not only by fish legs, but by all the novices from both the hooligan and meathead tribes. They stood around Hiccup in a semicircle. So, Hiccup, said Thuggery the meathead, what are we going to do now then? What do you mean? By asking Hiccup, demanded Snotlout crossly. You're not going to ask the useless to get us out of this mess, are you? He just single-handedly got us all to fail the final initiation test. We're about to be banished and eaten by cannibals, all because of him. You can't even control a dragon the size of an earwig. Can you talk to dragons then, Snotface? Asked Fishlegs. I'm pleased to say I cannot, said Snotlout with dignity. Well, shut up then, said Fishlegs. Snotlout got hold of Fishlegs by the arm and started twisting. Nobody, but nobody, Tell Snotface Snotlout to shut up, hissed Snotlout. I do, said Thuggery the meathead. He grabbed Snotlout by the shirt and lifted him clear off the ground. Your dragon got us failed just as much as his. I didn't notice anybody's dragon sitting up and begging like a good boy in the middle of that dragon fight. You shut up and I'll tear you limb from limb and feed you to the gulls you winkle-hearted, seaweed-brained, limpet-eating pig. Snotlout looked into Thuggery's stern little eyes. Snotlout, shut up. Thuggery dropped him and wiped his hands disdainfully on his tunic. Anyway, said Thuggery, my father was on that stupid council of elders too. I'm with Hiccup. What kind of father puts his stupid laws before the life of his son? And what kind of stupid test was that anyway? If we save all those stupid people from a real dragon like this one, maybe they'll let us into their stupid tribe after all. Well, 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 thought Hiccup. This is a turn up for the books. Maybe that dragon was right and he's going to help me with my it's hard to be a hero problem before he eats me, of course. One solo meeting with the Green Death. And here were 19 young barbarians, most of them much bigger and tougher and rougher than Hiccup, looking at Hiccup expectantly to tell them what to do. Hiccup stood on tiptoe and tried to look like a hero. OK, said Hiccup. I need some time to think. Give the boy some room here, yelled Thuggery, pushing all the others back. He swept off a rock for Hiccup to sit on. 
You just do all the thinking you need, Boyo, said Thuggery. This is a situation that needs a lot of thought. And I have a feeling you're the only one here who can do it. Anybody who can have a 20 minute conversation with a winged shark the size of a planet and come out alive is a better thinker than I am. Hiccup found himself warming to Thuggery the meathead. Quiet, yelled Thuggery. Hiccup is thinking. Hiccup thought and thought. About half an hour, after about half an hour, Thuggery said, whatever you're thinking about to get rid of that monster, better work for both of them. There's another dragon, asked Hiccup. Thuggery nodded. I went up to the highest point and spotted him while you were having your chat with the big green one. Okay, said Hiccup. That's good news. Actually, let's check out the new horror. The trail up to the highest point was littered with scallop shells and dolphin bones thrown up by the gigantic storm. Along the way, they even passed the wreck of one of Stoik's favourite ships, the Pure Adventure, lost at sea seven years before and now perched crazily on a rock three quarters of the way up the biggest hill on Burke. Once you were right at the top, it was possible to see most of Burke's coastline and the sea encircling you on all sides. Right at the other end of the island, a dragon entirely filled up on landable cove and spilled over the sides. He was resting his vast, wicked chin on the cliff as a pillow. Great plumes of violet, violet smoke were belching out of his snoring nostrils. He was another sea dragon, Giganticus Maximus. This time, a glorious deep purple in colour, and if anything, slightly larger than the one at Long Beach. The purple death. I presume, whispered Hiccup shakily. This is just what we need. Are you sure there aren't any more? Thuggery laughed, slightly hysterically. I think it's just the two nightmare killing machines. Two not enough for you. Back at the highest point, Hiccup outlined his plan of action. It was a fiendishly clever if a bit desperate. We aren't big enough to fight these dragons, said Hiccup, but they can fight each other. We have to get them really angry at one another. We hooligans will concentrate on the green death and you meatheads will deal with the purple death. <clears throat> the one thing we need is our own dragons, who seem to have disappeared, said Hiccup. So we'd better start calling for them. They called for the dragons as loudly as they dared and then louder still as there was no response. The 20 dragons that belonged to the novices were not in fact very far away at all. They had made up after their dragon fight and were now hiding in a piece of boggy bracken about a hundred yards or so away from where the boys were standing on the high point. They were crouching like giant cats in the ferns, wicked eyes gleaming. They were now so exactly the shade of a clump of bracken that they seemed to have melted entirely into the bog. If you had been a rabbit or a deer, you would not have noticed them. Until you felt the talons on your back and the hot fire on your neck. They'd been following the boys for a while. So, whispered Fireworm, her tongue flickering menacingly. What do we new do now then? The power is shifting on this island. The masters will not be masters for much longer. They are trapped like lobsters in a pot. We're not. We can fly whenever we want. Do we obey or do we desert? Dragons are not the sort of creatures to back a loser. Whatever we do, grumbled Brightclaw. Let's do it quickly. My wings are freezing up. We could kill the boys now and take them as an offering to the new master, suggested Sea Slug with a grunt 
of greedy pleasure. What the great green devil on the beach, said Harakau placidly. I don't like the look of him myself. He has too big an appetite. We might find ourselves as the next offering. We fly then, said Brightclaw, and the others murmured their agreement. Silence, his fireworm. These islands are perilous, she sneered. We might fly from one danger straight into the mouth of another, I say, we obey, until we are sure that they have lost. When that time comes, I will give the signal for us to desert. And so, as if from nowhere, Fireworm and Sea Slug, Horacow and Killer, Brightclaw and Alligatorgeiger and all the other dragons flew out of their hiding place and came circling slowly up to the highest point, landing on each boy's outstretched arm. Last of all came Toothless, complaining horribly. Dragons, said Hiccup, as he explained his fiendishly clever plan. And that's the end of chapter 13.